Herman, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining our show today. It's just such a pleasure to meet you in person. Mark, welcome. I look forward to it. So Herman, one of the things I was so excited about in terms of speaking with you today, you know, in my mind, clearly you're the global thought leader on such important topics like pricing and profit. And I was so amazed to find out that we have something in common, you and I. We both studied economics in university. Yeah, yeah. But it appears to me, Herman, that you may have done more with that education than I did in terms of continuing on with economics. Tell us a little bit about your journey to focus in on these two interesting topics. So how did, how did you get to this path of actually focusing very specifically in on pricing strategy and profitability? What was, that, what was the early days of that journey like and how did we end up here? My education at the University of Bonn was very theoretical, mathematical, academic. But I, I think that really contributed to a deep understanding of the mechanics of pricing, profit, etc. And a decisive step was my doctoral dissertation, which was on pricing strategies for new products. That was still very, very theoretical, mathematical, but I always had the ambition to have an impact on practice. So mm. I used these models and in my later academic career, applied them, did empirical research. And uh, obviously I, I, I published some practically relevant articles so that companies approached me and uh, asked, could you help us to get our pricing right. And that's how it started with some uh, small project when I was still was a professor at the university. And eventually this became rather big, but we'll probably talk about that. Yeah, that, that's certainly uh, a very humble understatement. It became rather big. <laughs> so, so of course, everyone knows you founded uh, Simon Kutcher and Partners. You've written 35 books on various topics, but focus, many of them focused on this specific topic, including true profits. And I love this, you know, confessions of a pricing man. Yeah, yeah. So, so with, a true profit. Yeah. There's true profit. So we'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end here. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things, um, Herman, that's going to be interesting to our audience here. So, so we have a lot of folks who are CEOs of midsize enterprise where they have a lot of control over pricing. And we have a lot of folks, of course, it's a sales podcast, a lot of uh, folks in the field selling. Um, maybe let's start with some of the things with your depth and experience and, and your view on the world today with businesses today. What are a few of the key issues that you do see, you know, from a strategic perspective that are challenges maybe with mid-size organizations regarding pricing and profitability? Let me start with an observation on the attention spans of CEOs and managers. <laughs> okay. And I have observed that over, over decades, if uh, the, the, the types are more inward looking, their main concern is efficiency and cost. And cost is, of course, a very important driver of profit. Right. If they are more outward looking, uh, their main concern and attention is, is sales, growth. Yes. And obviously sales is a second profit driver. And only for very few, the main concern is price. I, I've seen cases where we discussed in, in, in consulting projects, positioning, marketing, everything for weeks. And then on Friday afternoon, four o'clock, they say, oh, we still have to decide on the price. Now, the importance as profit driver is exactly reverse. Profit equals price times sales volume minus cost. Mm -hmm. And price has the biggest impact on profit. I can even quantify that if you can improve each profit driver by 1%. Everything else remains unchanged. For typical industrial and service setting, 1% price 
increase means 10% profit increase. So the profit multiplier of price is 10. In theory, we call that the profit elasticity of price. Okay. For cost, it's six. If you decrease cost by 1%, your profit will typically improve by 6%. Hmm. And for sales volume, it's only four. Why is, is it only four so much lower than for price? Because with an increase in volume, your marginal cost increase. That is the definition right. of marginal cost. And they typically eat up 60% of the additional revenue you get from the volume increase. So it's not 10, the multiplier like for price, but it's only four. So that is the ranking of the effectiveness of the profit driver. Price, profit multiplier 10, cost, profit multiplier 6, volume, multiplier 4. And if, if managers understand that, they change their attention to these profit drivers. By the way, when we do the summary of this podcast, and thank you, my podcast team, that's the quote for the front. <laughs> so, so, so the 10, 6, 4... Those listening today, if you only extracted that, that I think would be just an amazing nugget um, to pull away. So, so you also provided what I appreciate, Herman, you also provided very clear definition of profit. So I think we can move away in some cases from these academic definitions. And by the way, in technology and the world of SaaS today, of course, people don't entirely focus on things like profit because there's the rule of 40. My sales growth plus my profit has to be north of 40 and my uh, enterprise value is going to go through the roof. So, so we talked about a key issue, a key issue that, um, you know, the attention span of CEOs and pricing being something that's only thought of on the tail end of a sales cycle, which by the way, we see that quite a bit. I can absolutely validate that. We think about everything else and then we come to, to pricing. What are the other challenges that you're seeing when you're working with the companies who engage you today? I see two major challenges, which are so to say behind price. One is value or more precisely value to customer. Mm. This is the actual driver of willingness to pay. If a, if a customer perceives a high value which you are offering, he or she is willing to pay a high price. And creating values through innovation, through communication, that is the first challenge. So I, we, we say we are price consultants, but in reality, we are value consultants. And here another nugget. The Romans in their Latin language had the same word for value and price, namely pretium, like in precious. It has survived in, 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 in precious. Pretium must equal value, must equal price. If you understand this fundamental equation of pricing, you have another nugget to carry home. Value to customer and price must always be balanced. But another tip, let's assume your value is 20% higher than the value of the competition. Should you then charge 20% more? No. You should charge 10% more. You should split the added value with your customer so that both the customer and you get a reward, an advantage from the higher value. And you can even prove that theoretically, but I refrain from that here. But as a rule of thumb, split the higher value you offer about half-half with your customers. So this is my, my statement on value. And the second is, of course, a very hot topical issue, inflation. Ah. I, I just finalized yesterday a book on inflation. The working title is Beating Inflation. And 
this is the biggest challenge for the time being and will be for the next couple of years. But uh, the, the specter of inflation has arrived suddenly, very, very fast, unexpectedly fast. But it will stay with us for many years to come. And this is a very big challenge for most companies. Let's unpack that one in a moment, uh, Herman. <laughs> you've touched on kind of a real hot point for our podcast about value and pricing, pricing and value. And one of the key issues that we're finding in professional sales today through our lens and our experience and, and the folks that we work with, what we're finding is there is a challenge in sales in that they're very knowledgeable about our product and our technology and what we do. We, we don't always have depth and experience in terms of guiding the client as to how they should be looking at the impact or the value of what we provide. So, so we often, professional salespeople, can't actually build the financial business case for the re return on investment for anything that we're actually trying to sell. And what, what it, it's such an issue right now because the clients or prospects, they also cannot build the business case. They certainly can't do it in a, in a vacuum. Yeah. So as a result of which, and you spoke, uh, you spoke to Harvard in one of the, you were speaking about your, your speaking engagement at Harvard and something I was doing in terms of preparation for today. Um, two issues ago, Harvard published an article by Brent Adamson. You'll remember him. He actually wrote the Challenger sale about 10 years ago. But he's come up with a new topic with Gardner called sense making in sales. Because the, the number of, of prospects out there who are going through a buying process and then defaulting to no decision continues to increase because sales professionals are not enabling their customers to understand the value of our offering so that they can actually make sense of what the technology might do for them or the solution might do for them and then drive a decision based on the business case. And I, so I think there's that huge gap between value and pricing. How do we help the companies that you're working with and that we're working with on that topic? Where do they start? And, and how do we help them actually start to extract the, you know, or identify the true value of what they provide so they can price accordingly? Yeah, you are absolutely right. You're more right than you think. Okay. <laughs> that salespeople are often not able to convincingly communicate the value to the customer. And uh, the, the, the two most important value drivers are, one is innovation, that's obvious, but uh, we, we do studies every, every year, uh, global value and pricing studies, and uh, innovation is not as effective as you would expect. 72% hmm. uh, of the managers, thousands of managers, we have surveyed all over the world, say that they are disappointed from the result, the economic result of their innovations. Okay. And one weakness, and actually that is the second point which I emphasize in the, in the book on inflation is that we need much more effective value communication from the salespeople. Yes. And we talk mostly of, of business to business uh, relationships. And one problem is that value from the, the company, the salespeople, from the vendor is, is very often considered from an inside view, but you have to consider it from the outside view. And you said it in business to business, ideally you can calculate the value, you can express it in, 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 in terms of numbers, in quantitative terms, in, 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 in uh, return on investment. But what does this require? This requires that you know the process of your customer very deeply and yeah. understand his, her concerns. So it all starts with understanding the process 
and aligning this process to the technical capabilities of your, your product or, or service. And one other hobby of me is hidden champions. Hidden champions are global market leaders, mid-sized market leaders, often with market shares of higher than 50% global market shares. And when I look at their innovation processes and communication process, they say our strength is the integration of technology and customer needs. Hmm. And for large corporations, only 19% said that they master this integration of technology and customer needs well. So the challenge for salespeople is if they want to communicate value effectively, to integrate the technical capabilities, the technical parameters of their products with the customer needs. And that requires understanding both sides equally well. That's a big challenge, in particular, when you think of more complex, high-tech, modern, modern products. Uh, but I, I also think that companies are not fully, the, the leadership is not fully understanding this and not giving enough training to the salespeople to make them more effective in value, in communicating value. Boy, this, this is such a hot topic for the, the folks we talk to. Um, uh, you know, Herman, I could, we couldn't be more spot on. So in fact, a gentleman uh, in this podcast, two or three prior to the one to yours today, we were talking about this, where he's trying to cha train his sales team so they could literally write the decision memo that would go to the senior executive team within their client's organization to make the decision on moving forward with the, the purchase. My personal background over the last 15 years, 20 years, I, I spent a long time doing what would be called mega deals for outsourcing. And in those environments, because of the size of the transactions, which were hundreds of millions of dollars each transaction, yeah. what happened very early on is you had alignment with the client that you would only build one joint business case. So we had the expertise to help them with the business case and it was due diligence. You, it was almost like an M&A deal. You both worked yeah. together to build the business case and the financial model and both the client team and our team would completely agree on the facts. And they weren't, they weren't worried about sharing the facts because once you agreed on the facts, then they could still negotiate the amount of value. So that didn't stop yeah, them from, yeah, they, yeah, they didn't feel yeah. afraid to share because once everything yeah. was understood and we understood the return on investment, they would then come back and negotiate a higher return on investment. And yeah. that became a negotiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it was very effective for both parties determining, is there value in this transaction? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would call that rather what uh, I, I, I call a business ecosystem than a typical negotiation. Mm. In a typical negotiation, uh, you, you do not go that deeply and uh, the, the trust is not, not the same as you described it. But in a, in a business ecosystem, uh, several companies, independent companies work together and, and uh, exchange the full information and it's a long-term a very interesting case is um, asml they make this so-called extreme ultraviolet lithography machines and they are monopolists these are the big systems on which the electronic chips are made so intel and and uh, these companies are the customers of asml they have a monopoly in the world got it and they have such an ecosystem asml makes the end product Trumpf, which is a global leader in laser machines, makes a laser. This laser alone weighs 17 tons and has 450,000 components. Holy smokes. And the third partner in the system is Zeiss, which is a global leader in, in photonics and <laughs> optical products. And these three companies, mid-sized companies, are able to manage this extreme complexity. They work like one company, but they are independent. So this is what I call a business ecosystem. And I think that's very similar to the outsourcing case you described. But in a, in a typical vendor-buyer negotiation, 
you you don't have the same foundation level of trust yeah the, or, or level of trust and the, you have many uh, for instance automotive manufacturers often acquire an open book policy from their vendors but that invites the vendors to she to put more cost into a system because it 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 would mean that uh, practically the buyer the large companies control the profit of the of the vendor uh, but in the case you described and is in, in the business ecosystem you have openness trust and uh, that is the foundation to extract the maximum value from your ultimate customers absolutely so herman one just just on the value topic before we move to your third point on inflation one of the other things we've seen in the market that i'm really interested in your opinion on as an expert is that one of the challenges with identifying the value of the, the true value of the solution is that many organizations, many in the large, will build business cases based on the internal financial models required to make a decision on any major investment. I've also found that after making the purchasing decision, they rarely follow up on that original business case two, three years down the road to actually identify the performance against the original business case or to identify the true value of that investment. What's your experience with that same topic? Um, my experience is consistent with your experience and uh, it's it's very complex just, just to describe a few concrete cases. In one case, a large engineering company, they sold these systems, uh, which cost uh, 20 million, 100 million, so really big uh, products, machining centers. And one of the most important cost factors was solving the problems after the installation until they got the systems ru running smoothly. That could take months mm. with huge costs, but they never allocated these costs to the project because that would have made many of the project unprofitable. Right. Uh, and, uh, another uh, very, very important aspect, both from the, uh, the, the perspective of the buyer and the vendor is that the value of services is, is, is often not included. Mm. For the more complex products get, the more important uh, get the support services. That, that could be training, uh, that could solve specific technical problems, adjustments, or advice, everything. And neither the costs are allocated correctly, Right. from the side of the uh, the vendor nor do they try to to quantify the value of these services mm. some are offered free some are offered oh. against charge and on the buyer side it's it's similar uh, they say oh the product is exchangeable it's it's like a commodity but the service they get from one supplier and from another one may be totally different Mm. If you compare, say, a, a German product with a Chinese product, the product performance may be similar, but the service you get from the German company is far superior and very often decisive for the, uh, the, the buyer's uh, result with the product. So my suggestion is also to pay more attention to service, try to really, uh, for instance, for one chemical company, we could distinguish 42 different services, oh, separable wow. services, 42. Wow. Uh, but half of them did not offer true value to customer. So we canceled them. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, but they cost, of course, huge costs for personnel, etc. So look at the services as diligently as you look at the product and the product advantage and the economics of the product. That applies to both sides. That's important for the salespeople to make transparency that they offer more, better, higher qualified services. And it's equally important for the buyer not to make a naive decision where you pay only attention to the product price, but 
don't consider the augmented uh, services around the product. On the second it's very point. difficult to quantify, uh, but you must somehow do it. But you, the costs are there, these are numbers, the prices are there. If you supply three, you have costs on the other side. Is that, again, according to the Latin word, is that value and price balanced or is it unbalanced, which is uh, very often the case? What a great point to bring up. And by the way, it's, it's not particularly complex. We all live this. Those of us mature to, enough to have purchased a few vehicles, at some point in time, it becomes a little less about the features of the vehicle and much more about the service, you, <laughs> so, yeah. the whole experience you receive yeah. when you take your car in yeah. for service. And that can be a one negative uh, kind of impact from a service perspective, and then you'll, you'll move over to a different brand of vehicle. You, yeah, you know, another very, very topical point in this context is supply chain. Supply, no kit, right. These days, very tough. Is, are you getting something from China? Or if you are based in Toronto, are you getting it uh, from, from somebody from Quebec only a few hundred uh, miles away? Yes. What are the risks in the, the supply chain? They can be huge or they can be manageable, controllable. Yes. It, in, in that case, you have to include that in your own calculation as a, as a buyer. What risk do I accept and what is the value of this risk? And risk being such a key component, you know, of, of the three desired business outcomes of every, every company, yeah. they've got to but manage it's the risk. Most, uh, yeah, it's the most difficult to, to quantify very often, yeah. And when you mentioned in that example, um, Herman, about these 42 services being provided by the chemical company, half, half of which the client really wasn't getting any functional utility from, they didn't really get any value from them. How did you know that? Did, was that by encouraging that client to do deep customer surveys or interviews with Yeah, we client? did. Uh, that was a project of us where we investigated the value of these services with the customers. And there were services like advice on inheritance tax, things like that, provided yeah. by the chemical companies. These were paints to the paint shops. No, none of the paint shops uh, entrepreneurs asked the chemical companies, they asked their tax advisor for right. advice on, but they had a couple of experts uh, to give advice on inheritance tax to the, to the paint shops. Nobody wanted that from the side of the customer because uh, they asked their tax, tax, tax advisors for that. It's just one example. What a great example though, that customer intimacy, understanding, you know, the world of our client and it never ends. It's always, it, it, you know, I, I really think it's diving deeper and deeper and bathing in their environment. So we understand what they're going through. The more we understand that, the better position we are in to help them achieve that better future. Great topic in terms of value pricing. What, it, what learning for all of us, that prisium, the Latin word for pricing actually is value and pricing. There's a yeah, great- Same goes. A oh, great yeah. data point. Um, Herman, let's go to that, that third topic you identified, really key for right now, inflation. And you said, we're going to have to start to think about this for the next few years. Let's unpack that topic a little bit. What's happening and, and how do you see that impacting what we all do from a, a business perspective? We currently have an inflation in the, in the consumer price index of around 8%, 8.5. It was in the US, 7.5 in Germany. So it's the same in all developed countries, mm. with the exception of Japan. It means our costs are increasing. Energy costs, raw materials, everything is getting more expensive. And the challenge is, can we pass these cost increases through to our customers? Right. And uh, it's naive just to pass them through in the same percentage or absolute amount because that totally neglects the willingness of the customer to pay more. Mm. So we have to understand what is the willingness of the customer? How does it change? How is it effective? And just to give you one comparison. In our studies, we found that 
of consumers, I take a consumer example now, pay much more attention to prices when they buy food, et cetera, in the supermarket. When vacations are concerned, only 18% pay more attention to prices. Uh -huh. So it means your, your lever to increase prices is much more limited in the consumer, in the food sector, than in the vacation business, because people due to COVID-19 haven't been traveling and they want to go on vacation now. And you have to understand these differences. Yeah. Another very important aspect is what we call pricing power. The ability to increase your prices so that you earn a decent profit. If you are a small guy, say in the food or in the automotive sector, and you have the big retailer as your customer, your pricing power is very limited, unless you are irreplaceable, your product is so unique. If your pricing power is high, for instance, currently for electronics products where you have uh, bottlenecks and scarcities, you have high pricing power, you can pass through your full cost or even charge a little more. Uh, the, so that, that is a big uh, question mark in this situation between increasing costs and increasing prices. Mm -hmm. What is your pricing power? You have to assess it realistically. And then there is a big challenge for the sales force. I mean, if we look back at the last uh, 30 years, you can say we had no inflation. Hmm. They were discussing price increases once per year. Now we see that tire manufacturers friends, have already increased their prices four times this year. You, you, you will be permanently in price negotiation. You meet higher resistance from your customers. So you, you, you need training how to argue the price increase you need. Plus, you need training in hardening your, your resilience as a salesperson. Hmm. The, the last inflation we had was in the 1970s. Nobody is any longer. I'm, I'm the only one who is still around from the 1970s. <laughs> All the others are retired or uh, passed away. So we have no management has no experience. Salesforce has no experience wow. with real inflation rates. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if the rates inflation really goes higher to 10%. And then we have the following experience also from a very recent study. The implementation rate of price increases currently is 33%. What does that mean? Of the price increase demanded by the vendors, they only got 33%. And that was 50%. I, th I think that's a little too pessimistic. Uh, people are under in, under pessimistic uh, mood currently, uh, but over the years that's typically fifty percent. That you mm -hmm. get fifty percent of what you require in the first uh, step of the negotiation, but it means you have to require more and try to get fifty percent. If you get off with fifty percent, so if you need seven or eight percent, you must start with fifteen percent. And now assume. You come as salesman to a, a powerful customer, an important customer, and you ask him for a price increase of 15%, they will kick you out of the door. Uh, right. So this will be a different life for our salespeople. Well, well how interesting. So, but once a year, um, Herman, we get asked to comment in some magazine about how to communicate price increases. It used to be about once a year. So we, you know, we'd be, we yeah. have a little yeah. quote and a paragraph yeah. and so forth. Right now, you're absolutely right. Over the course of the last year, we've had lots of clients come to us saying, we need another conversation with our sales organization because we, we're, we've implemented another price increase and it's destroying their self-confidence and their momentum. You know, it's, it's yeah. really having an yeah. impact on employee satisfaction because, and I think even the, the way you just explained it, it's so helpful because I think in many cases, there's this understanding, particularly for large organizations, they don't, the, the sales teams don't understand what's behind the price increase. And so that example you used was absolutely perfect. For some reason today, I'm very aware of how much it costs today to buy one avocado in Toronto. 
We like yeah, avocados. Yeah. Let me, that's a very good example. Somebody, a journalist asked me a couple of days ago, how can it be that tomatoes are 40% <laughs> more expensive? Right. right. That's a price increase for tomatoes. So he said, how can it be? What do tomatoes have for his, uh, with Ukraine or, uh, or, or whatever, or the supply chain from China. And I just last year visited a huge tomato growing plant. They make 13 tons per day. Hmm. And you know what their most important cost factor is by far? That's energy. So they add water and some minerals, but the big cost factor is energy. And mm -hmm. their energy prices have tripled. So I say, what you buy with tomatoes is energy. We have the same price increase, 30, 40% for tomatoes as for, for oil and gas. But people don't understand this. So uh, you, you, you really have as a salesperson to understand what are the cost drivers in your company. And I suggest in the inflation book that the CEO must create more profit cost transparency for the sales force yes because you need this argument in face of your customers yeah it's an it's an absolute you must great. really be able to explain why you need a price increase and it cannot be in the interest of your customer if you go bankrupt because you cannot pass through your increased cost the cost are there you cannot influence the oil or, or gas price or the price of copper which has uh uh, is 10 times higher or so than it was a couple of years ago. So the customer must accept, but you have to, to convincingly argue the case you do. for the price increase. Yeah. And, and one of the, th I completely agree. And one of the things that we always recommend, um, Herman, is we need to understand, again, customer intimacy. Before that conversation, I actually want to understand what's happening with my customer's business. And what are the cost drivers affecting their business? And how many yeah. times have they communicated a price increase to their clients yeah. over the last yeah. period? And what has been their experience? And yeah. frankly, from a very tactical perspective, if we start that conversation with that topic and it becomes front of mind for them how they've had an increase in most of the elements of their cost models, so they've had to communicate an increase to their clients, and we know exactly what that percentage was and why, I think they're far more understanding. They're still going to negotiate because they're paid to negotiate. Yeah. But then it, it's, it, it's an easier transition to our conversation about, guess what? We're experiencing the exact same things. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. You, you have to understand the, the value chain. Yes. Before, so uh, upstream from your company and also downstream. I mean, there are, of course, people who, who profit uh, tremendously, profiteers of inflation. If you have an oil well, which <laughs> produces a lot of oil, you profit from the higher oil prices. If you are a highly indebted, you profit from the fact that you pay back to your debt in, in devalued money. Um, but understanding the value chain, what happens with your vendors in your company and with your customers is helpful also for uh, a reasonable discussion with your, with your customers. Yeah. Absolutely right. And, and I've, I've had some wonderful meetings with executives recently where we've got the entire sales organization together to just explain why we're doing what we're doing. So, so, and have a good conversation, allow the salespeople to air some concerns or issues and give them that context, that transparency, you know, of all of this, you know, makes sense. And oftentimes we may have a price increase that really isn't dramatically incre increasing our EBITDA or our profit. Yeah. We're just yeah. And that's another challenge. I mean, even, even defending nominal profit is very difficult under right. these conditions. Let alone re real profit, so inflation. And, and, and that's another thing which should be taught to, to everybody in the company. Don't be uh, misguided by, by money illusion. If, if everything 
every price, every cost increases by 10%. Your revenue is 10% higher. Your profit is 10% higher. Your price is 10% higher. But that doesn't mean anything in terms of real profit because if you inflation adjusted, deflate it, you are again at the old number. Uh, and defining, defending real profit, this is very, very difficult and few companies will achieve that. Right. And what I would also advise, I, I, I do that in my new inflation book, that you, you teach people a little more what inflation really is. What is inflation? Right. What is inflation? Prices of, of products go, so go up, products are more expensive. That is not inflation. Inflation is that money is devalued. If you express the value of products, again, I go back to the Roman times. In terms of gold, there is no inflation. With an ounce of gold, you could buy a custom-made tunica that was the robe of the Romans in Rome 2,000 years ago. With an hour an ounce of gold, you can buy a custom-made suit today. <laughs> so the value of products, of goods, has not changed. The value of money is changing. So uh, I, I always find when I discuss these more uh, comprehensive, some of these general issues with business people, they find that enlightening. To, to take it a little way that it's only about price increase, it, it's, a, it's about a more complex phenomenon. For instance, if you think of consumer goods, and I said 54% are, are paying a lot of attention, are very sharp about prices at the supermarket counter, you must understand that you cannot pass through your full costs. I, I talked to one of the largest retailers and he said, we, we have, at least for the time being, we have to absorb about 30% 30, 30 of that. And another study we did, uh, we, we found out that about 40% uh, can be absorbed through price increases, pass through, about 20% through cost uh, efficiency, productivity efficiency, and you may have to absorb 30, 40% of the inflation by temporarily for, for a year or two accepting a lower profitability because the willingness to pay of the customer who ultimately decides is not going up as fast as the inflation rates in some markets. And that's another, another lesson. The general inflation rate is irrelevant for your business decision. You must know the very specific inflation rates from your uh, vendor side and also on your what you said, you understand how much did you increase price, how much did your cost increase. So look at your very specific situation deeply and don't be uh, guided by the general inflation rate. Oh, that's great. It, it's um, I'm nodding. For These are all topics. Many others I have, for instance, the role of digitalization is very important for inflation. What is the biggest impact of uh, digitalization when it comes to transactions. Again, that's more for the consumer market. It's a dramatic increase in price transparency. Mm. At your fingertips, you have everything. Right. Prices for everything. To collect the same information in the old world would have required days and hours. Right. T telephoning uh, companies, looking at reports. Today, you have it immediately at your fingertips. Yes. So this has a different, a, a very fundamentally different uh, consequence for how consumers react to price changes. Yes. Herman, you've touched on everything. The, the way you explain things, you take complex concepts and simplified so much, which I love because I need it. I need it to be simplified. It's so funny that that point you brought up about certain things resonate in terms of a price increase so much more. I brought up that avocado example. Yeah. At our, at our kitchen table, you know, a month ago in the same conversation, 
we talked, uh, my beautiful wife and I talked about, wow, these avocados are getting expensive. We have to be thinking about, you know, how many of them we put in our morning shake. And in the same conversation, you know, less than three minutes later, we were delighted to make a decision on a vacation where clearly we were paying 30% more than we've ever paid yeah. for any yeah. vacation ever and didn't even blink, you know, yeah. didn't even huh. blink. <laughs> and we were so happy to do it and just couldn't wait to jump on a plane. So it's so funny, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the relevance of certain things that become a kind of a, 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 a trigger, you know. Yeah, so you confirm what we found out in our I survey. Sure did. But there's one other very, very important aspect in this, what you mentioned. You don't spend a very large share of your income on avocados or tomatoes. Right. But for low income people, if they have to pay uh, 10, 20% more for food, for basic necessary food product, that's dramatic. Yes. So their reaction will again be very different. Yes. Say they buy with a discounter instead of the normal superstore uh, market, et cetera. And segmentation and ensuingly price differentiation in the inflation under the inflation condition is another very important thing. For instance, we found out in, in an um, industrial survey for industrial buyer of in, in one specific project that we could increase prices more with the customers who had been most profitable in the past. Yeah. So we analyzed the achieved price increases relative to the margin we had earned from these customers. Hmm. And we had much higher success rates for highly profitable customers than for low margin customers. And why is that so? It's so because the margin today reflected already the value appreciation of these customers. If customers right. had been willing to pay more in the past, it meant that they perceived a higher value from our offering. And that translated, you can say one-to-one -one into the price uh, fulfillment, the prices we achieved in the necessary price increases under the inflation. So that is again a point understand the differences, the segmentation uh, of your customers, and then adjust your actions accordingly. And don't just go uh, with, with one number into the market and say everybody has to increase 10%. No, it may be some people you can get 15%. In other cases, you get only 5%. Um, so, so Herman, your team has been so kind to us to give us an hour of your time today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the truth. I don't re-listen to many of the podcasts we record because like most people, I have a psychological problem of listening to my own voice or seeing myself on video. I can't stand it. <laughs> this is going to be the podcast I'm going to listen to two and three times with my notebook and my pen to be taking notes because I've learned so much from you. So, so first of all, as we wrap up out of consideration for your time, thank you, thank yeah, you, thank yeah. you. What if I met in the last word, Mark, uh, that is my autobiography. There I describe my whole experiences and wisdom. And uh, we created a company which has today 43 offices all over the world, uh, 1,800 people, and we are the global leader. And the story of this is in this book, Many Worlds, One Life, From Farmhouse to Global Stage. Thank you. That'll be a book I'm going to enjoy for sure. And of course, folks, the company, as you heard in the intro, Simon Kutcher and Partners, unbelievable. We've just been speaking to the global thought leader on pricing, profitability, and in many cases, strategy. This is going to be one you're going to want to listen to again and again. So one way to learn more, many worlds, one life. Okay, Herman Simon, many worlds, one life. Herman, how else can people stay connected with what you're doing? My homepage is hermansimoninoneworld.com. Very simple. And there you'll find all contact information hermansimon.com. So team, that'll be in the show notes for today. 
Uh, I'm sure you'll all join me in, in thanking again our amazing guest, Herman Simon. Herman, I hope our paths cross again, and thank you so much for your time on the Selling Well podcast today. Thank you, and regards from Germany. Regards from Germany. Folks, we'd like to thank all of you for listening to the podcast today. And if you got value from this podcast today, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast. If you have ideas for me, Mark Cox, on how to make this more valuable to you as a learning tool for those in professional sales, please let me know. My personal email, Cox at inthefunnel.com. Send me a note and let me know how we can make this more valuable to you as a learning tool. And thank you all for joining.